people that clearly communicate the gospel to our family, our friends, and our peers. <coughs> Lord, we're here for you. <coughs> Not for any other reason. And though we be few in numbers, Lord, I can't help but think about Gideon. And I pray that you look upon us this morning with Gideon faith and Gideon eyes, Gideon obedience, Lord. Slay your enemies. Bring majesty to your name and cause a revival to break out in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we sing all the time about God breaking our chains. And how many know that song? My chains are broken, my chains are gone. We sing the Chris Tomlin one, Jesus Culture's got one. We sing all the time about our chains being broken. But how many know all chains aren't bad? Sometimes we wear a chain around our neck with a symbol of our faith. Sometimes we wear a chain just because we want to bling bling. Not all chains are bad, right? There are some chains that are good. If you got a killer Rottweiler and it's on a chain, that's a good chain. <laughs> right. Some chains are good. There is a chain of change in the scripture. And this morning we're going to talk about that chain. And the first chain, or the first link in the chain, is the link of hunger. Because I will tell you that hunger strikes at the heart of everything that is the gospel. It was hunger in the Garden of Eden that caused Adam and Eve to eat of forbidden fruit. On the mountain of on the mount of uh, on the mountain, Jesus, communicating in the Beatitudes, said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. In the, children, in the wilderness, the children of Israel came out of their bondage, and they hungered, and God rained down heavenly manna. For 40 days, Jesus fasted in the wilderness, and when he was hungry, the devil appeared to him to tempt him. Hunger meets a basic human need. Or it works as a basic weapon of the enemy to destroy humanity. So unless we properly understand hunger and why it exists in our midst, we will never really understand the purpose for with which we were created. And that's why Jesus did say, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for more for consumables. <laughs> for righteousness. Because when we get the right hunger, right things start to happen. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Bless the day that hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. What? Habakkuk, chapter 3. You don't have to go there. Um, Jack, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of second, uh, first chapter of First Samuel, that's what we're going to be reading of mostly from that text today. But in the time of Israel's captivity, Habakkuk, crying out to see God move, crying out as he remembered the prophets, crying out as he remembered the exploits of old and how God parted the Red Sea, how he rained down manna from heaven, crying out about the great uh, miracles of their ancestors. Habakkuk cries this prayer to God. In a time of trouble, in a time of mediocrity, in a time when everybody was off watching the games at the Colosseum instead of in that temple of God worshiping the Lord, seeking his face. Habakkuk Christ in this prayer out. This is Habakkuk 3, 1 and 2. A prayer of Habakkuk, Habakkuk the prophet said to Shikhanoth, O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you. Anybody ever heard somebody's testimony in here? And it just kind of went, man, I would like God to do something like that in my life. You ever thought to that to yourself? 
Well, that's exactly where Habakkuk's at. He's saying, I have heard how they have talked about the greatness of your name in generations past. It's written in the book. We've read about it. He says, I have heard the report of you, and I am in awe. Oh, Lord, revive your work in the midst of these years, or my years, or our year, years. In the midst of the, these years, make it known. And in your wrath, remember to be merciful. Do you hear the hunger in that plea? Here's a man who's sitting on the precipice of watching his nation perish. He's on the precipice of seeing his people with a lukewarm heart as they serve God. He's despairing that the Spirit of God that's in him and speaking through him prophetically it's not going to be moved or be seen in his day or lifetime. And in utter desperation, he falls to his knees and cries, God, we've heard of what you've done yesterday, but what about today? How many know you can't live on yesterday's manna? It gets stale and wormy. Unless you're trying to make toast. We were never meant to live on yesterday's promises. We were never meant to live on yesterday's miracles. We were never meant to eat stale leftovers. But we do. And why? Why would God have fresh manna for us every day? Do we settle for leftovers? It's stale bread. Hunger. That's why. We've hungered. Let's not for heaven. And therein lies our problem. And therein, therein lies the total relevance of Jesus' statement. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. It should be already there. We are going to be reading a good portion of these first two chapters. Not all of them, but a good portion of them. Because I want to show you what biblical hunger looks like. But where we should be at in our Christian experience. I will tell you, this church and the dream of this church is something that has been cult and being cultivated in my heart for 35 years. This November 14th will be my 35th birthday in the Lord. This dream is our child of faith. There is something that God wants to do in our midst. And he requires us to be hungry. In Hannah, God bless the story of Hannah. It gives us a glimpse of what we should aspire to in our faith. Beginning with verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramatham, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elohim, the son of Toha, the son of Zeph, an Ephraimite, and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had, had children, but Hannah had no children. Hi, ladies. Welcome. Good morning. In other words, Hannah was barren. And for a woman in the Old Testament, okay, now let's set a little background here. For a Jewish woman in the Old Testament, they were still waiting for the promise of the Messiah to come, right? And so they believed that when they gave birth to a child, that that child could be part of the ancestral line, would be part of the heritage of Israel. They believed they were given birth to the promises of God, and now he would bless his people. And many of those women did. And God was not, uh, uh, he, he, he did not favor them. Rahab was a harlot. 
She was rescued from Nod, from Jer Jericho, and she is in the ancestral line. What God looks for is not our purity, but our, our, ob our obedience and our availability. God will rescue anybody and use anybody who makes himself available. <coughs> Rahab believed in God, and her, one of her children uh, became part of the ancestral line, and she is in the ancestral line, the, physical, the genealogical ancestral line of Jesus Christ. And so for a woman in the Old Testament to be barren, it was a grief to their heart. It was like they were removed from being part of the community that would uh, contribute to the kingdom of heaven being manifested on earth. It's not the same for us. If, we, if a woman in these days and age, day and age doesn't have a child, it's not that big a deal. They just go get a career and move on with their life. There may be a part of them that longs to give birth to something, but we don't have nearly the same emphasis on childbearing that these women did. So we have to see what, what it is, it's the desperation that this woman had to give birth to something. <coughs> something that would be blessed and something that would be ordained for holy worship. And this man went up out of his city from year to year to worship to the sacrifice of the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas priest unto the Lord were there. And when the day came that Elkanah <laughs> sacrificed, he gave to Penanai his wife and to all her sons and daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah. There's an important point here we're going to make about that. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Hmm. Okay, now here's this woman who's trying really hard to have a baby. Longing for a baby, wanting to give birth to something, but the scripture says the Lord shut up her womb. Hmm. And her and her rival provoked her sore. Okay, how many know uh, two women being this is the reason why God created a man and a woman. One man and one woman is God's perfect plan for marriage. One man and two women, that's a battle zone. Hmm. Okay? So Elkanah has two wives, and the one's having kids like rabbits, and the other one's got none. Can you see where that's going? And the one that has kids, you can't have any kids, ha, ha, ha. Come here, Jess. Come here, Julie. Come here, Rain. Come here, come here, come here. She's calling her kids. Can you imagine the brokenness in that woman's heart? As she's sitting there listening to the names of her children be called out of this other woman, and then the woman provoking her. Can you see the hunger being created? The emptiness. And yes, she had a husband that loved her, and he gave her a double portion. And how many know that when you're longing for something from heaven, <coughs> Until God meets that need, there's no human being on earth that's going to touch that need, right? And that's where we get into a whole bunch of trouble. Because we start looking at other people to touch that need, and they can't. Because Elkanah, her husband, was not in the place of God, and he could not open up this woman's womb. Only God could do that. And God shut her womb for a season to create a hunger in her. To create something in her that longed for his touch. To create a problem or a crisis in her life that no one else could meet. And that's exactly what the Christian life brings us to. It brings us to a place and to a something, a problem that no one else can touch. God, if you don't do this, it's not going to happen. If you don't intervene, I'm not done. I'm done for. I'm a goner. And really, that's when we get a proper perspective of sin. That's exactly where the cross takes us. It brings us right up to the place of knowing that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. There's not one righteous, no, not one, for all of sin to fall short of the glory of God. And there's no one that can bridge the gap from here to there except Jesus Christ. And so we are all in that place of desperation. We might not be crying out for a child, but we're all in a desperate place. 
that if we don't see God intervene in our lives, we won't give birth to anything that's heavenly. Okay? So we can identify with this woman if we really see the gospel in her story. Verse 8, And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up, and they had eaten at Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest was sitting upon his seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul. Have you ever been in that place of bitterness of soul? And prayed. unto the Lord, and she wept. My Bible says sorely. And she vowed a vow. I wish I had a nickel for every time I said, God, if you do this for me, I'll never do that again. God, if you do this for me, I'll never do that again. And I will tell you what. Who, who can... Uh, gee, do you guys have two Bibles open or just one? Somebody flip your Bible open with... Uh, Somebody with a loud voice, uh, find Ecclesiastes 5, chapter 4. And I want everybody else to turn there, but I want, to, I do want to read that passage of Scripture. Because in vowing a vow, listen to her vow. <clears throat> While you find that Scripture, whoever you are, thank you for being used to the Lord. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of, my, of your handmaid and remember me, and do not forget your handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. In other words, what she's praying is, Lord, if you will open my womb and give me a child. You got it? Ecclesiastes 5.4. You could probably read verse 3, too. Let me see. How's it going? A dream comes when there are many cares. Yeah. Will you stand up and read that? 3 and 4. A dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. Ooh. <laughs> How many know that Christians are supposed to be people of our word? Because if you don't have your word, you're not a person of integrity. <clears throat> How's somebody going to believe you about the gospel of eternal life if they can't even believe that you're going to be where you say you're going to be on time? Mm -hmm. Hello. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Our word matters. And it matters to God. So here this woman is making a vow. And Ecclesiastes tells us when you make a vow to God, keep it. God doesn't take any pleasure in the foolish ramblings of people that make a vow and don't keep it. And you know what? He very often does not answer because he knows whether it will follow through or not. So she makes a vow and she promises to give this child to the Lord. And guess what? She does. And it came to pass that she continued praying before the Lord. And now let's see. Let's jump down to verse 17. Then Eli answered. She's she's in the she's in her tent. She's in a tent of meeting and she's praying and Eli thinks she's drunk and she says, No, Lord, I'm just longing and hungering for Lord the Lord. And I'm a woman of sorrow. And then Eli realizes that she's under distress and duress. And and he looks into her heart and God opens his his mind and gives him a word for her in verse 17. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. The God of Israel grants thy petition of thee that you have asked of him. And she said, Let thy hand may find favor in thy sight. And did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. There's a place in prayer, a place in life. And I have been there many times, and I don't go there nearly often enough. That when we're in the travail of our soul, we can go to the Holy of Holies and obtain help from the Holy One of Israel. And we do not have to get off of our knees until we have done business with God. And do you know what the sign 
of having transacted with God is peace. He's the Prince of Peace. When you've done business with God, He gives you sweet peace. And there's joy. Joy forevermore. So she gets up and goes on her way. She goes on. She continues on the natural course of, of living out her daily routine, living and loving her husband. And guess what? The time comes to pass and she conceives a child. And she gives birth to him. And she remembers her vow. She nurses the child long enough to wean him. And just as she promised, she takes that child to the house of God. And she knows what God, that God has hurt her. And you know what she named the child? Samuel. You know what the name of Samuel means in Hebrew? God hears. For God has heard. I mean, at this point, one would hope that the whole room, that the whole country would be hungry. Shouldn't it produce in us a hunger to know that we have a God who hears? Shouldn't that create something in us to know that if I go to Him, He will hear me? Shouldn't that knowledge produce some kind of desperate interaction and experience with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Why doesn't it? I keep coming back to this question in my own life. And when I look around at the world and the Christian church in America, I keep asking myself, why? Why, God? Why are we not hungry? Why are more people at home watching football this morning than they are in the house of God longing for the bread of heaven? Why? There's something wrong with us. And it's not God. The problem is not God. And this is why our country is going to hell in a handbasket. The problem isn't God. It's me. My heart has cooled. And I have become fat with the things of the world. I no longer lust after God. I lust after the things of this world. And to be entertained. And I worry about things that I don't need to worry about because the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. The problem is me. It's me. I, it's me. Me. I am in the way. I'm the, I'm the uh, eclipse. I'm the lunar eclipse. Blocking out the light of heaven. It's me. That saddens me. But at the same time, it fills me with hope. Because if I'm the problem, then guess what? I can be the solution. Because God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He's left nothing out. That God gave His very best. He gave the Son of God. The very Prince of Heaven. The very image of God which the angels worshipped. The Bible says no man has seen the Father. But Jesus Christ. He is the eternally begotten image of God. Colossians 1.9 He is the express image of God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, John chapter 16. He is God. And he got off his throne. He humbled himself and put himself in the most vulnerable position there are to there, there is to be humans. A tiny baby. Completely dependent on humans. All oh, believe me, those who support abortion, who fund for abortion. They're going to stand me for a holy God who was once an infant. Believe that. And the fires of hell are being heated ten times over for their greed and their lust. You can't tell me it's not a human life and then turn around and sell it for body parts to another living human. That's an oxymoron. 
He's coming soon. And He's coming for a hungry bride. Hungry. Who's aware that He gave His very best. He took off His princely garments. And He took on robes of dirt, dust, while we were formed out of the ground. And He put those rags, those sinful rags, on for us. And then He spent most of His life being hungry. And then he was buried, put, hung upon a cross. And you know what? Hung, you know how the cross? You know how crucifixion works? You hang there <coughs> by those nails, and the muscles in your arms and your legs begin to swell. And as they swell, they cut off the oxygen supply that is being co coursed through your body through your vein. So you literally starve to death from the inside out for want of oxygen. Then your blood begins to separate and your lungs fill up with water and blood. That's why when they pierced him through the side, the water and blood came out. He starved to death. Starved to death for oxygen. So that we never had to hunger again. God, I want to be hungry. I want to be hungry for that kind of love in my life. I don't ever want to be unfaithful to that kind of love. I don't ever want to be complacent about it. But I'm a man. And just like you, I'm rock with this rock called sin. The next link. Gratitude. Why gratitude, you say? Mm. Well, after Hannah drops her son off at the temple, and now God has taken away her reproach, and that woman, Hannah and I, she's got her husband's double portion of love, and she's got a child who now serves in the temple of God. And I will tell you, I couldn't be prouder of Tyler. He's writing in his own journal. He reads the writings of my ramblings for the last 30 years. That is a boy whose heart is on fire for God, and you protect, pray for him, because I know the enemy's going to be gunning for him. But I believe God, and not just for him only, but all the kids in our youth who are loving God. And we have some amazing kids in this church. Amazing. All of you are amazing. She's got a son who's worshiping God and serving at his altar continually. Her reproach is gone. Do you think she was grateful? Do you think she went to bed at night whispering Samuel, knowing her in her mind, the God who hears me, for God has heard. What do you think's coming out of her heart? What do you think her thoughts lend themselves to throughout the day? if not for a holy God who has answered her prayers. And therein lies the wellspring of gratitude. Gratitude comes from hungry people who have been fed the bread of heaven. And when they get fed with that bread, you're spoiled forever. Wonder bread has nothing on you. You're liberated forever from day old bread. Because gratitude says, I got to have the real deal. I want some nine grain stuff that sticks to your ribs. Oh, yeah. Slap the peanut butter on there and make it chunky. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Chapter 2. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord, and my horn is exalted in Jehovah. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies. Get thee behind me, pen and I. You can no longer say I'm barren. God has filled my life with His presence and filled my womb with the fruit of, of His purpose. Go. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. And let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by Him actions are weighed. 
we must be very careful in the house of God how we treat one another. Because when you're looking on somebody else and they're in a moment of their, their own reproach, pride goes before fall. Pride goes before fall. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. Hallelujah. I'm going to read that one again. And they that stumbled are girded with strength. Anybody here stumble from time to time? Okay, the rest of you are lying. <laughs> they that stumble are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. Now they're out there working in the fields. Oh, we were, oh man. That was such a great loaf of bread. Oh, bless God. And now they're out in the field hungry. Look at this. And they that were hungry have ceased to hunger at all. Yea, the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children languishes. The Lord kills and the Lord makes alive. He brought down to shale and brings up. The Lord maketh poor and he maketh the rich. You know why? Because both have problems. And both problems create a hunger in us. People that are rich, you know what they hunger for? Community. People that will love them just because they love them. 